The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Film Wednesdays. I'm your host, Sonji Lopez. Bronx Film Wednesdays is presented by Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater and BronxNet. We bring independent films and short films that you will love from our 21 Islands International Short Film Festival. Travel the world and open your mind to stories as far as the imagination can go. Maya Angelou once said, each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it, possibly without claiming it, she stands for all women. Women's rights are human rights. With recent political events threatening rights of women everywhere, this month we dedicate our show to the life, struggle, and rights of women by featuring films about women directed by women. Today, we bring you the feature documentary, Nailed It, directed by Adele Pham, who we will have an interview with later on. From Los Angeles to the Bronx, Nailed It introduces the people behind this booming and sometimes controversial industry. Nail salons offer the Vietnamese community a pathway to pursue the American dream and financial independence. Along the way, the filmmaker, who is part Vietnamese, learns about her history and develops an even closer connection to her culture. We also bring two short films from our 21 Islands International Short Film Festival that is currently open for entries. 21 Islands features short films from island nations, island states, island cities, and island territories around the world. Remember to submit your shorts to the 21 Islands International Short Film Festival by visiting filmfreeway.com slash 21 Islands International Film Fest. We can't wait to see your films. Now we bring from New Zealand, Milk, and from the UK, Broken. Home, Jack. Uh, you going to the dance? <laughs> Come on, it'd do you good to have a night out. Like old times. See you in the morning for milking.
your pistol. Give it to me. Your pistol. Are you okay? Help him up. Help him up! Go! My husband will be home soon. Do you hear me? Edie! Who are you talking about? Those Nazi bastards! 
murderers! There's a U-boat. There, there was a U... One of them's still here. Come out! Come out, you bastard! This bloody war is doing all our heads in. Listen no. to me. They won't let you keep the farm if they think you can't handle it. Come on. Come on. Sure. Can you take care of the girls in the morning? Yeah. Oh. Take it. Could do with the claim. Okay. Good night, Edie. This is not something that's going to go away. Illnesses such as these involve management with medication and therapy. Now this is part of her life and is going to be an ongoing concern. My advice to you is to make sure that you have a support system around you while you're supporting her. 
Now, I'm prescribing these to be taken on a daily basis for the next three months, after which we'll do an assessment and see how well the treatment is working. If it's working at all. You okay in there? Yeah, Grant. Come on, let's go and get these. Yeah. Here you go, Napet. It's okay. Yeah. Come on, join me. No, I. Uh... <laughs> come on. Uh, no, I. I don't dance. Yes, you do. Get up. Come on. No, I. Uh, I'm very awkward. I. <laughs> Even better, come on. <laughs> no, I'm really, I'm, I'm very awkward. <laughs> come on. No, I... <laughs> Up you guys. Oh, God. Okay. Wait for me. 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 Welcome back to Bronx Film Wednesdays. Now we present our feature film, Nailed It. I go with my sister. We go to places called Beautiful Nail. It's kind of confused when I first read the sign, though. Beautiful Nail. Just one. Nail is beautiful. Nail salons. They're everywhere. Every city, state, strip mall. Uptown, downtown, even Walmart. When I don't have nails, I feel really naked, like, oh my god, I need my nails. <laughs> you got beautiful fingers, you got diamonds on them. I know they look good. The nail industry is a seven and a half billion dollar industry that focuses just on nails. And more than half of these salons are Vietnamese. If you're Vietnamese American, within two degrees of separation, you have somebody working in the nail industry, if not one degree, your auntie, your uncle, your relative, your cousin. <laughs> There's somebody you know. I'm half Vietnamese and even I have family in the business. My dad wanted me to go work for them but I was embarrassed to be associated with doing nails. I didn't want to be that kind of Asian. Okay, honey, do you lie pedicure too? Uh, no, no, just my nails. Honey, why you don't lie? 
so I stayed away. But I was always intrigued. If the nail salon is so shady, the dark side of the nail salon cause something like this. It's gross. Why is there one on every corner? And how did Vietnamese come to dominate this multi-billion dollar industry? six or seven years old, the only way I could watch TV was when my mother said, hey, take these empty nail polish bottles, take this stainless steel BB ball, drop it inside each one of those bottles when you're watching cartoons. <laughs> that's, what mom, that's what mom asked for, so you do it. This is Mike Bo. He's a lawyer, but helps run the nail polish company his family started a few years after they escaped from Vietnam. The impressive thing for me is that with the little education that my, my parents had, yeah. they had the smarts to somehow buy a building and get it permitted, and neither of them have a college degree education from the, from the U.S. So can you imagine? I mean, I can't even fathom, like, okay, how did two people just end up doing that? Really, it was Mike's mom who got them into the business. She went from speaking no English to opening her own chain of salons to manufacturing polish within a few short years. We choose to stay in the industry because we know it is an important part of our culture. It's an important part of who we are. Mike's story impressed me, but what about the people working inside the salon? Daddy! Jane, put the skateboard on the side. Don't bring it here. On the side over there. No, 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 no. On the side. You know that Jesus Christ was the first recorded pedicures. Oh my gosh. Before the Last Supper, yeah. he washed all his disciples' uh, feet. Oh. Yeah. So, Bob, is it, if it's good enough for Jesus Christ, is it good enough for you? <laughs> huh, Bob? Huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? I got into the nail industry like a lot of people, uh, by accident. I started my family young. At that time, I, I got laid off as a technical engineer. And so my in-law, who owned a very successful uh, nail salon, uh, recommended, you know, that, hey, uh, I should go get my nail license. And I remember it was kind of awkward for me because, you know, when you think about doing nails, you just think about, oh, it's a woman's job. I can't, I'm not going to be sitting there doing nails and doing people's feet. You know, what the hell is that? I don't want to wash my own feet. However, if you have a baby on the way and you don't have a job, uh, you know, things happen. I haven't looked back since then. And this is going on for over 20 years now. Word, you can't deny his word. Today, Kelvin helps at his sister Nadine's salon. She runs with her husband, Bob. Right. You have to carry that cross. Don't forget to carry your cross, too, bro. What are you doing? The better but he also runs his own. What do you think about this right here? And travels the world as a sales rep and nail educator. Who knew so many Vietnamese guys do nails? What a job, huh? Sitting around all day holding women's hand and then after you finish, you get paid. I spent some time in Kelvin's salon getting to know him. Not only do we share the same last name. What? He takes karaoke seriously, just like me, okay? Yeah. Already the nail business was way different than I imagined. You gotta take a snapshot of it. and I had a new partner in crime to join me for the ride. Our first mission? To find out why so many Vietnamese do nails. You can see the light. All right, welcome to Vegas. The nail, nail business is the, is the big, door, gateway for, for opportunities for the Vietnamese. And I'm not talking about only Vietnamese that is coming from Vietnam, but Vietnamese that are living here. Whether they're the first generation, second generation, or the third generation. The fact is that there is money to be made in the, in the nail industry. Right. 
in your own opinion, bro. Why are there so many damn Vietnamese in the nail industry? You know what? I don't even know. I never knew myself that we were just like, it's like a niche, I guess. It's something you can learn quickly and do well, and it's a cash business. So it's easy. It's fast money, and they don't need a lot of education. I think it's because one, because they're smart. They're smart people. Vietnamese and have a lot of talent. They're fast. Vietnamese is good with fingers, with the hands. Whoever started it, whoever was the first one to say, hey, you know what, I'm Vietnamese, but I'm going to do this whole nail game thing, it went and it spread like fire, and now there's, it's such a huge community. And who was that person, the first Vietnamese to do nails? I still, uh, I still want you to meet her. So, thì cháu muốn hỏi là, tuần tới thì hãy cô có thì giờ là, you know, can we go just meet you and maybe we have lunch or something like that, go? All right. Okay, okay, bye bye. Do you think there's more Chinese restaurant or Vietnamese nail salon too? I think Go. more Vietnamese nail salon. <laughs> more Vietnamese nail salon than donut shop. <laughs> I love it. So, okay, then let me ask you. Ko Tuan Le came to America in 1975, part of the first wave of Vietnamese war refugees. When I first come here, I don't even know I can make, a, I can make money on nail business. But uh, one movie star, her name is Tippi Hedren. I think everybody know her by now. Yes, that Tippi Hedren. From a little Hitchcock movie called The Birds. This is All Things Considered, and we begin this hour with a manicure. For thousands here in the U.S., the manicure has made the American dream a reality. The story goes she was a great humanitarian who really wanted to help the Vietnamese find a place in the United States. After Saigon fell, she was working with Vietnamese women in a Northern California refugee camp. They call Hope Village. A group of women doesn't know what to do with themselves like me. So one day we look at her finger there, we said, your nail looks so beautiful. So she said, I have a job for, for you, Monday Creepy Class. Hedren brought in her personal manicurist to teach them the skills of the trade. An idea was hatched. Hedren convinced a beauty school to train them for free. So 20 of us go through the training class. Every day, volunteer people come to the, to the camp, take us to school, and we go from morning to evening. I heard that the, the first 20, most of the women were, were like a school teacher in Vietnam. Is that true? Or? Some, yes, some school, school teacher. General wives. General yes. wives. We have three general wives. Three general wives. Three, four uh, <laughs> colonel wives. Wow. Yes. Uh, some of us, we had a much better life in Vietnam except that we left behind. So when we came here, we saw a chance to have a job and work to raise the children. But we took it really right away. They became self-sustaining women on their own, and that's pretty much where the nail, the Vietnamese nail industry started. I grew to love these women, mm. and we had fun together. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. Yes, we were so beautiful. Yeah. See the feeling and the environment and the way we treat each other is beautiful. Because of her. She make all fun. She just create something to make us feel happy, yeah. not lonely, yeah. because that's a new life, new future, new everything. I left Vietnam a week before it fell. 
I live with my um, two little girls and uh, my sister-in-law with her children. So that's all I remember, just a chaos at the airport. I mean, how do you handle losing everything and knowing you can never go back? It was very scary time. Yeah. You, you come to a country, everything new, I got no job, not a lot of money. It's really scary. We didn't know what would happen and how we would live. That is really the, the common thread between every Vietnamese American here and why they're doing nails is to take care of your family. The story of the first 20 isn't just about nails. It's about how Vietnamese became American. My history. Growing up in Portland, Oregon, I wasn't that connected to my Vietnamese heritage. I identified more with my mother. It was hard to get close to my dad, and he's my only real connection to Vietnam. When did you come to the U.S., Dad? Uh, November 1975. So right around when the first 20 Vietnamese nail techs came to the U.S. Yeah, but that only happened in California. When Saigon fell to the communists, South Vietnamese soldiers who fought with the Americans were granted political asylum. My dad was one of them. When the first 20 were escaping Vietnam through military connections, my dad was on a South Vietnamese gunboat off the coast of Da Nang. From a refugee camp in Thailand to the American South, my father kept moving, fought, and came closer to death than I'll know. To end up working in shipyards and factories. Dad never got out of the factory, and because of his struggle, wanted me to go learn nails with my cousins in Washington. Oh, they're doing it well. Yeah, they live in the house. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. You have a couple of half for rent. Without nail, how you got that? You know. So when you wanted me to go nails, you wanted me to go make some money when I was seventeen. Yeah, when when you graduate from school, that often they wear the nail nail business coming up. Uh, and back then, your cousin don't speak English pretty well, so they may need you to in the nail salon with them. But you have more run to go. That the way it go. My identity is all tied up in this thing. And that's something I wasn't expecting. For the thousands of Vietnamese who got out, now face uh, the difficult task of trying to adjust to new cultures. We had to hustle like we sell water to wells. Ripples form lines turn into a story to tell. We had to leave hell, but put your faith in me. The next generation of the true Vietnamese. I just get out from Vietnam and I'm very sad. And you worry about your father in concentration camp and brother, sister there. So my heart always hurt. But nobody know until I start to do the nail. They, they ask the story, you know, I tell them. So at least they, they go through my story. But um, before, they don't have a nail shop like we have now. We just work in the, in the beauty shop like this. They only have American manicures, but because the owner no tippy, he took me in the shop. You know in America, it's not easy to find a job when you came out and you said, oh, I just passed my test. Yeah. Here's my license. Yeah. Who would hire you? But they all hire us because tippy hatred. Before 1975, 
the Asian nail salon as we know it didn't exist. So how did it go from 20 women to a multi-billion dollar industry? By the end of 1975, over 125,000 Vietnamese refugees had settled in the U.S., most in California. And Vietnamese talk, so word spread that nails was the thing to do. The Vietnamese community is very close-knit. It's a very family-oriented culture. And family work together, so they opened their own shop. They would sponsor family who was still in Vietnam. They helped them get educated in doing nails. They get better, they have some money, they spring out to open another nail shop. And those folks also invited their family members. And they keep multiplying. And the more nail shop, the more money Chris they, they, they need. And it just kind of blossomed from there. And where they blossomed changed the whole game. When you think about the beginning of the, the Vietnamese nail business, we don't think of it as Vietnamese nail in the Beverly Hills. You understand? We think of it as it came from the hood. Yeah, it did. The, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, the, <laughs> tell it me a little bit it. about that. Meet Olivet Robinson and Charlie Vo. In 1983, they grew the first nail salon chain in the hood, South LA to be exact. How did you decide it to open a salon in that neighborhood? That first one? Yes. Because that's where we lived. Cheap. That's where our customers were. At the corner, it's cheap. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. We had got the place, but mm -hmm. we didn't have a name, remember? Right, right. You know, we got to make something them pretty. Sexy. We yeah, want something sexy. We, yeah, we got to, we're making these women pretty, uh -huh. getting them together so they can go out and trap a man. <laughs> and we just kept on talking and talking, and pretty soon, I don't know which one of us said, <gasps> trap man, man trap. <laughs> and there was, there was the name. On our window, we had a picture with the lady here with the spider web, and there's a man trapped in the spider web. <laughs> man trap. <laughs> Their first salon was full service. All of it ran hair, and Charlie ran nails. And from the beginning, it was a family affair. Charlie's husband, her brother, sister, even Olivet's daughter Kim did nails. That's where Mike Vo grew up. I saw him. Charlie is Mike's mom. Down here, down here. Kelvin also got his start at Mantrap. We used to have lines. I remember we used to have yes. for holidays. New Year's. Oh in, my New Year God. Yeah. We long couldn't even line. go home. Uh -huh. Here come long line of customers standing outside. And after that, we say, hey, the, biz, the nail business is booming. Within two years, the duo opened nine salons, most nails only, all Vietnamese manicurists except for Kim, and like the original, in black communities. Black women love to be fine. We pay a lot of money for what it is that we want. And at that time, what they wanted were long, sculpted nails, acrylic, a dramatic update from the paper wrap Juliet manicure of Tippy's Day. You know the one that you said was a high maintenance? Yes. That girl could do some hair with them big old long nails. Yeah, Ooh, that's something new. It was art. Co-workers saw their nails, and then we started getting white, white women, Mexican, Hispanic Spanish, women. Yeah. You know, they was like, ooh, we want some of that. Black women were early adopters of sculpture nails and set off nail art in the 80s. Trends rehashed in hashtag today. Rhinestone, charm, drill in the hole with the string, snake skin stuff. Snake skins came from <laughs> us. <laughs> Nobody had snake skin before we showed up. Nobody. Nobody. This lady right here, she would cut it to fit the nails. And put it, she started wearing it on her nails, and people were like, ooh! And that, it took off. Wow. A lot of memories today. Yes. Vietnamese were shaping their niche in the culture at Mantrap. And nails proved a toolkit for survival for countless refugees, cascading in from a swelling wave at sea. The exodus grew to flood proportions early this year. And in six months, Southeast Asian nations have been inundated. Malaysia, 77,000. Hong Kong, 66,000. 
Indonesia at least 55,000. It's believed more than 200,000 Vietnamese have drowned at sea trying to reach foreign soil. We, we didn't know how to swim, but because the freedom dream is so big, you just want to go. We did not eat for like about a whole week. And then we saw the pirate. They just took some of the children after that, they, they throw it back to our boat. I threw my daughter from 20 feet high. I never had that, that fear in my life, like on that night. As the world learned of untold thousands of Vietnamese boat people who died trying to escape, the U.S. was pressured to allow more refugees enter. And by the end of the 80s, over 525,000 Vietnamese had resettled in America. Có thể nói là nếu mà cái labor force đó đông như thế, tất cả các cơ quan xã hội khó điều chỉnh cái đời sống của họ, khó định cư họ, mà ngành nghề neo là một lối thoát. A former lieutenant in the South Vietnamese Navy, Minh Nguyen became a social worker resettling refugees in Southern California and wrote a new chapter in the Nail Saga. He Hedron is the mother of the Nail. I am father of the Nail. <laughs> Min learned about the business through his wife, Kien, who took him to see an old high school friend from Vietnam. He's so exciting about what I'm doing. And then anybody come to America, he said, Nail is a good profession, make money right away. Look at Thuan, you know, she's in Vietnam and now she come here, she make good money. So much so, Min left social work to get his nail license. I just thought he was the sweetest man in the whole world. Shar Riley was his teacher. I can remember when I first started teaching manicuring in 1975, I would have just a couple of students. And then it just like exploded. All of a sudden, we got a huge influx of Vietnamese students. Majority were young women. I didn't have a lot of older men, so that's one of the reasons I remembered him. I just thought he was such a sweetheart. If only she knew what Min was up to. In 1987, he and Kian opened their own beauty school, now called ABC, Advanced Beauty College. ABC was the very first nail college. It looked like a million people in there doing nails. I like all Vietnamese, right? Every last one. For the first time, nail classes were taught entirely in Vietnamese. Yes. Min also lobbied Congress to allow the state board test be taken in the language of this new nail force. Có những người có tiền ấy, người tiền người ta tập hợp hàng chục tiệm they were coming up everywhere. It was like rabbits having their little bunnies. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the center where we were, before we finished, there was like six. And one of them was named Nail Trap. The owner came to us and told us that we had too many flowers and that she was going to get some of the petals that dropped. In other words, we were in competition. We, it was on then. I remember back in the 80s, a, a full set, you know, 10 fingernails, dolled out, looking great, easily ran 150 to $200, easily. And fill in for 35 to 40, the new comers, they come in, they make the price like everything half. And they have a price war. At one time, the price for a fill went down to like, Seven dollars, I believe. That was crazy. We worked from seven in the morning to 10, 11 o'clock at night so that we could survive. Right. To really understand what's going on, you have to understand the people. You have to understand where they came from. Anyone who's gone back to Vietnam, you can see the way businesses are run. There's the meat section, there's the tools, there are sections of town that just handle all that. 
So when you have a store, your next door neighbor has the same thing, and so does a guy 10 blocks down. So how do you become competitive if you don't have any, uh, any niche product, right? Well, you cut prices. Today, only two of the original man traps survive. By 1991, Charlie and Olivette had passed all of the salons down to their employees. Vietnamese had taken over with prices that iced out American manicurists, including the first person to teach the first 20. At that time in my life, I was angry. I needed time to understand that, that it wasn't, it wasn't anger. I think I was probably afraid because that was my livelihood. I was trained for nothing else. I had put my heart and soul into that. I worked like a dog. I, I built up a training program, and it was my livelihood. What made something else so much better than me? And there was a lot of leftover residual feelings, and it stayed that way. Older Americans recall when the U.S. absorbed a much larger number of refugees. The majority of Americans did not want to accept these Vietnamese refugees who they saw as completely foreign. We left our country, our families, and all the things which are familiar to us to look for freedom, to buy freedom at a very expensive price, and to come here to work and find all the hatred and jealousy. That makes us disappointed. That is not worth the price we pay for our freedom. We turn now to the fire debate back home, the backlash against refugees. After 40 years, refugee resentment is more extreme. Mr. Trump asked, quote, why are we having all these people from S blank whole countries come here? We're going to keep our country safe. Yeah, I brought you one because I was trying to sell them. <laughs> no, you don't understand. Like, <laughs> wait, I doubt. I went to Vietnam and my friend from Cambodia because I really like Kramat. This is my girl Sully Da Salon. She's Cambodian, but got into nails through Vietnamese she grew up with in the Bronx, who share a similar <laughs> refugee experience. She works seven days a week, and she has kids. People think that if it's an Asian nail salon, they just think it's one kind of way, and they kind of make assumptions that way. To be honest with you, it, I didn't feel any way anyhow because I wasn't thinking about them. I was thinking about the money, you know, trying to help myself, help my family. Right. Thinking that we come here, don't speak English, immigrant, making the money, taking the job. And so out of that frustration, they just cuss us out. And I told everyone, all my employees, don't get mad. Take your money home, feed your baby. Ooh. That's what's up. Without the Vietnamese people, would this industry be as big as it is? I don't think so. Through the 90s, the Vietnamese population continued to grow, and so did the nail salon, powered by new immigrants sponsored by extended family. How many members of your family do nails? Uh, currently, 36. My cousin they just came. Yeah. Yes, because my, my cousin just came from Vietnam, him and his father. Uh, they're here to live forever as well. In all different states, too. Yeah, we um, have like California, California Arkansas, New York, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Boston, Boston. Yeah, Connecticut. Yes. The Vietnamese saw an opportunity and went for it in any area. But the deluge of nail salons in this unregulated industry also had unintended pitfalls. Nail care nightmares. How dirty is your beauty salon? You'll never believe what our hidden cameras found. We're going undercover this is the Vietnamese salon I remember growing up in the 90s. The 
first hitting camera exposés, catching those low down dirty Asians in the act. Are all the workers in here Vietnamese? Yes, we're They're Vietnamese. We're all family though. They're springing up. They make everybody think that all nail salons are dirty, which we're not. You know, we're, we take this business very seriously because this is our livelihood. We're just hardworking people. I don't know what we're doing wrong here. Why do you think the Vietnamese have such bad reputation in the industry? I think it's more the fact that they're always looking for the best price. They're trying to make that fast money. I do for you, long better. Thanks. It's okay, honey, only $4 more, that's okay. <laughs> I think because a lot of times they speak in their language. So it's kind of hard to sometimes communicate. This thing was scrubbing my foot so hard, I saw blood. No, and no. when I started nutting up and acting a fool, she tried to act like she didn't know English. No offense. <laughs> I got toenail fungus. Oh my gosh. It's, yeah. I know, it's from horrible, a but I cannot get rid of it. I, I swear I got it from those bowls. Automatically, like, those know, pedicure like... spas, so time consuming and so tedious to disinfect them. If you take the time to do all the sanitary things like you're really, really supposed to, it's gonna take you longer. If it takes you longer, then you're making less money. So you have to cut corners. Have you met a lot of people who have gotten like horrific infections? No, not personally. Mm -mm. I have not. Right, we see it a lot in the news. Mm -hmm. To find out the dirty truth for ourselves, it becomes overblown. Can cause infections, finger herpes, and more. You have to take care of the customer. You have to do the laundry. Let's head out. Man. When I first got into the industry. When I used to go to shows and I would meet like, you know, uh, American nail techs or even educator, <laughs> I would always get the sense that, you know, like, oh, you Asian. So that, that means that you, you can't do nails or, you know, you're not clean or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that, that. No matter how much the salons change, once a stereotype has found a voice, it's hard to shake. Uh, wait a minute. This one's a little crooked. Angela Johnson's impression of Tammy, the stereotypical Vietnamese nail tech, was one of the first videos to go viral. No, honey, that your finger do like that. That video, that comedian, is hurt me. I, I, I think the same way too. You know, it's it embarrassing. Me. Like for us, like we, I, we speak like broken English, and then they laugh at us because our accent is different. Do you like Credo Gio? <laughs> what? I say, do you like Credo Gio for your nail? It's the best thing on hand for your nail. It's like nice, sparkle like diamond in the sky. Do you like Credo Gio? What are you laughing about? People working hard. And trying People to work working hard? On the table, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Is this a matter of me making fun or the truth stinging a little? Mm -hmm. You know? I had been coming to this nail salon since I was 12 years old. So she saw me grow up, you know. And I came in one day with my, my photo, my Raiderette headshot, when I became a cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to her, mm -hmm. right? And she was so proud, mm -hmm. like so proud of me because, you know, she had yeah. seen me grow up. And, and that is what she said to me. She said, I knew the foot time you were in here, you looked like a model, <laughs> cheerleader. <laughs> And so that's why I say like everything that I say in that story has been said to me at some point. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, since you've been going to the salons uh, since you were 12 and uh, being around uh, uh, Vietnamese people, um, that probably had an impact on how you look at life too, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, to be able to connect with all people, mm -hmm. all cultures and having relationships yes. with people who are outside of who you are, who don't look like you. And That's like the heart you. of the nail salon you don't see online. Beyond making fast cash, it's like, it was like a blessing. There's a community, <laughs> friendship. When you're here with me, you enjoy the time you're here with me, and I enjoy the time I be with you. Don't think about anything else. A place to feel good. Once I come here, this is my time. And I feel, you know, this is my leisure time, leisure time, so I enjoy coming here. 
Uh, I see. You got a little design on your. Uh... Yeah. Little ring fingers. <laughs> Me. See. So. Um, and you all with that, huh? Yeah. And more in a bag of chips. That's right. That's how I feel about myself. That's right. Man. I have clients that I've been doing the nails for over 20 years. 20 years, every two weeks. 20 years, every two weeks. Kevin is a nice person to be around. He really is. He would give me his problems, and I'd work them out for him, and I'd give him his, and he'd try to work mine out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How but he could, work out? he couldn't do nothing. He couldn't do nothing with him. <laughs> Babe, don't mess with us. Don't mess yeah. with us. Don't mess okay, with us. That's it. right, baby. That's let right. See, let me see. Let me see. Look at Miss Hassie. Look at Miss Hassie. Oh, oh, 15 years later, now I gotta picture. go out and help her get out of the car and shit to bounce her in here. Liar. <laughs> Liar. It's about relationship. So. Mm -hmm. So. Oh man, you can make me cry, baby. No, I can't do it. No. Okay, well, okay, I'll try it. Anyway, um, this right here, this right here is one of my clients. Her name is Alice. I've been, I've been doing Alice Nails for about 15 years now. If you are able to communicate mm -hmm. with that client mm -hmm. and be able to embrace something that mm -hmm. they embrace, you got it made. Mm -hmm. You got it made. They, they're coming back to you because of, of that. Mm -hmm. They're coming back to you because mm -hmm. of that. Communication, right? Communication. It's in the same language, right? Communication. The same language in here. Mm -hmm. The same language of the heart. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what you have to have. The boss. Mm -hmm. Hey, boss. Oh, Before Charlie and Olivet dreamed of going into business together, they were client and manicurist and friends. Thì mình thấy bà này rất là dễ thương. Bà này nói chuyện rất là ngọt ngào, rất là dễ thương. Thì mình hỏi là bà có thể lâu lâu dạy thêm tiếng Anh cho tôi không bà? Thì bà nói bà sẵn sàng. We had a little school going. Whenever I would go, I would teach her words, teach her how to say it. Bà nói là hỏi thăm là uh, tuần rồi có đi đâu party không? Uh, lập gia đình chưa? Có boyfriend không? Mm -hmm. But Charlie and Olivet's partnership is an anomaly. It's a shame the nail salon was copied, but not the bond between two cultures that made it pop. Without all of it, the industry might not even be what it is today. And I want Vietnamese to recognize that. I know, huh? Mm -hmm. Even though we like to think that racism is dead, it's not. The relationship that I had with Charlie, we learned to trust one another through the trials that we went through. I protected her in a sense and she protected me. So I think we had that more than anything else. Do you remember that? <laughs> if you can feel one person's pain or joy, then you're really forever united with that person. We are all connected. connected somehow. There is no doubt in my mind right. that we are. It dawned on me that I came from another country. My mother was a young widow, war widow, and I was a young woman. At the time, the nail thing. <laughs> the nail thing. And it came up and it helped another young woman with a child to make a living. And it did so for a lot of other young women. Look 
at the similarities. Yeah. Don't look at the differences. Yeah. You got it. Dusty survived the Vietnamese takeover, and at 84, still works as a manicurist. Her daughter, Robin, also continues the trade. It was a wonderful opportunity. I didn't know at the time how absolutely phenomenal it was. I really did not. The nail industrial is uh, helping us to survive, and actually to raise our kid to the next level. Did any of your children go into the nail industry? No. Nope. Did you not want them to go into the nail industry? Uh, yes or no. <laughs> Something that I've noticed is that some second generation, even first generation, like they don't want to be associated with nail shop Asian because they think it's looked down upon. I believe that, uh, that it has a lot to do with our egos, okay? Here I am, I'm the first generation. I'm the mom and, 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 and pop that, that opened up this uh, nail salon. Worked my butt off to make it successful so I can make good money for my family, right? So just imagine you are my daughter. And you might hear something where, man, those damn Vietnamese nail salon, they yep, 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 they this and that, that. and it might affect you. You don't want to be associated with that. And you might feel, feel embarrassed that your parents own this successful business. So for the people that look down on this industry, I just ask them, like, you know, just check yourself. Because without this industry, the, the Vietnamese community in America could have been a little bit different. Hey, hey Adele, you, can you eat uh, Vietnamese food, right? Yeah. All right. Yes, you love this. Bob, Kelvin's brother-in-law, also got his start at Man Trap. Well, my wife's been doing it for a long time. Uh, more like probably like seven or eight years before I started, so I was just following her footsteps. This is family life. When the kids go to sleep. Uh, I kind of liked it because, you know, it calmed me down from where I used to be. Well, that's good that you know what I mean. Fighting, <laughs> drunk, and, you know, <laughs> in and out of jail because, you know, getting in trouble. All right. Out of jail, I decided, you know, to uh, start my future. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Let me get a little more buzz and I'll tell you more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. This one right there, Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. How'd that Hell yeah. It's just funny. It's like, you know, we, we have this uh, inside joke, you know, mm -hmm. that when you see a Vietnamese, nice looking Vietnamese couple driving a nice Lexus or nice Mercedes, you automatically think that they own a nail salon, dude. Well, you know, I don't see it like that. I think I'm a little bit more discriminated. Nowadays, I think about it. I say, why you look down on that guy? I mean, you know, you don't know what he does, right? He do honest living. But it's normal to have the stereotype that, you know, exactly. like, if you do nails, that means that shit, yeah. you're working on people's feet, bro. What do you feel about that, Bob? You are like a low-life <laughs> peasant. I, I, I didn't choose nails, man. but. I happened to find a passion about it, and of course, uh, the situation I am back in the days, and you know, I'm, I'm, everything, you know, I work hard for it. I have four kids, married to my wife, and we have a salon, and we have a house, and I am blessed. Mm. Amen. Amen, dude. Amen. Amen. Mm. Amen. You cut this, okay? Amen. <laughs> Uh, thank you everybody, uh, please one, two, three, for all my friends and all my friends here. Yeah. I read this word just out before, when grandma passed away, in the doorway of the church. Hanging with the boys reminded me of hanging with my dad and his buddies. But my dad's story is different. 
Are you single back then? Have a very top offset to sponsor. It so was, it was hard for you because you had no family here. Well, half of everybody, but you get used to it. I think the woman easy to adjust, but the man, it, it hurt him more. My husband, he loses everything. I said, you know, what can I do? I can do everything to, for him to, he, you know, can be a man again. Even now, every time I, I tell my kid that happened, I still feel like, a, you know, we start real hard. Yeah. And my father would say the same thing to us. Even though he was the educated one, even though he knew English before mom, mom put him through. Behind um, every Vietnamese school, salon, there's some Vietnamese woman that powers it. Farm family, right there. Uh, and you, and me, together. <laughs> There's always kids like me who wanted to distance themselves from the salon. And there's kids who grew up doing nails, who saw an opportunity and even a passion for it. The kids are taking over their parents' business and they're changing the whole game. Currently, I own three salons and I travel all over the world right now as an international educator. You know, your parents want you to become a lawyer, a doctor, a pharmacist. But I said, Mom, Dad, I have a different goal. I have a different vision. I currently have about 132,000 followers. When I first got into the game, 2009, the designs were very simple. But today, it's a lot more complicated now. People want Swarovski stones. They want more detailed work. It's fun. You get to create and then just chat away, do magic, and for me, I get to be surrounded in glitter. I know, it's like a dream come true, and I get paid too, oh my gosh. But this new generation also inherited problems that lingered from the beginning. More hazardous than just toenail fungus. I remember walking to my aunt's salon. I always wanted to hold my breath. I'd open that door and that whiff of acrylic just permeated through the air. All the fume from a liquid acetone yeah, we'd be and just, smoke, we'd be. smoke from the curling iron is yeah. everywhere in the air. <laughs> we would be lit. <laughs> Early on, ignorance was bliss. But as the years rolled by, you heard about people getting sick. Skin rashes, difficult breathing, cancer, breast cancer the most. My sister-in-law lost her baby eight and a half months pregnant. The doctor said because the baby been inhaling so much um, chemical that she's been doing all day long. So what the hell is in these products? Toline is known to cause cancer. Formaldehyde is what they use to embalm you, come on. And what's that other one? That glutathione or something? That was enough right there to make anybody run. In Europe and Japan, beauty products containing these ingredients known as the toxic trio are banned, not in the US. Here, chemical companies lobby to keep them in without regulation. It wouldn't be the first time the Vietnamese have been poisoned by American chemical interests. That's the Vietnamese culture. People rarely talk about, um, about their illnesses. We Vietnamese have an expression, chưa thấy quan tài, chưa đổ lệ. That means if you don't cry until you see the coffin. When I see my parents work 80 hours a week, it hurts me. I know it's bad for health, but um, a lot of the older generations are not political. We're just you know, hard workers and you know, do what we have to do to survive. I think like, it would be taken care of if they like charged more. They have these vents sucking up all the dust 
all the fumes. Of course, like, that's not cheap. And if I'm gonna charge like $25 for a gel manicure, no, there's no way I could possibly make money. The national average full set is $20. Most salons here, you get 60%, the owners get 40%. So you keep 12, owner keeps eight. Vietnamese people, they don't want to raise their prices because they're scared that they're going to lose the clients. They want it fast and they want it affordable. I know that, I know it's a better way, I know it. After seeing her relatives suffer from nail salon work, Yuan Nguyen left a career in chemical engineering to open her own salon that is well ventilated and toxic trio free. And no acrylic at all. So only um, natural and shellac. It lasts longer than the regular polish, and it's the only company that I use that guarantee that they don't have the formaldehyde and tooling. I charge $39 for a mani pedi. About 10 minutes from my shop, they only charge or 28. It's not about the price, but about what is the consequence that they have to carry with them after come to that nail salon. The problem is, demand for salons like UN's hasn't taken off everywhere. It's not fun in here today it's because the door is open. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we do two, three customers, it, it's not a big deal. But if we, let's say it's Friday, Saturday, usually it's really packed in here. Even though you cover your nose with the mask, as you can see the dust here, it's a lot of dust, it's a, it's a lot of fume, it's a lot of headache. So you imagine you sit seven hours doing the same thing. It's a lot. I ask myself so many times, why these people that they have breast cancer, miscarriage, why? So the first of all, I think the nurse salon people, we should empower them more and then spread health education much, much more for them to understand their own issue. There's a lot of fear out there, but no guidance. Change has to come from the inside. Studio, salon. Right now we have uh, Facebook, we have internet, we have um, nail magazine, even in Vietnamese. We need to support and we need to read. We have to have a knowledge. And not only us, but the next generation, they're going to pick up. I think we are making the change. We're talking about the Vietnamese nail industry or the origins of nails in the United States. Can you imagine if we as Vietnamese in the nail community all unite? how powerful we will be. You feel busy at that? Strong. Strong. To let the fresh air come in and keep the fresh air, you know, flowing. Finding the story, our shared history, Seeing myself reflected in everybody I met. Everybody, that's a nail right there. Hi, Hi. Hi. Last name Sam. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> what is that village? What village is that? Da Lang. Oh, that's uh, where my dad is from. Oh, you're from Da Lang? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we are like in a family. I felt connected to my people. Family helps, man. Family helps. Jeez. Big time. To a legacy that is still unknown. If the fall of Saigon was a history, the nail industry is just like the destiny of us. And the people I had looked down on are the heroes. So much strength had to come from all of these people to be able to survive here. And they did it. It was really a journey. A beautiful experience, I have to say. And don't forget, they said, Money Chris is minority in the beauty shop. Yeah. Hairdressers only in the front. Money Chris is back. Yeah. But now we took over. Today, when immigrants are even more marginalized, how amazing that refugees, women, developed a space not only to be accepted, 
but that they own. That's something to be proud of. It is the money. Everybody needs money, the black, the white, the Japanese, or whoever. But if you treat each other right, you're going to get them coming back. They're going to bring somebody back. It's simple as that. Hey, Lefty, what do you think of my fingers' nails? Am I taking good care of them? Are they, like, they oh, looking good? Oh, no, honey. Honey, honey, honey. <laughs> no, no. You know I got to feed my family, honey. You need to come in Austin. You need to come in two weeks, not two months, all right? Support the system, please. <laughs> Support the system, OK? Yeah. We sell water to wells, ripples form lines, turn into a story to tell. We had to leave hell, but put your faith in me, the next generation of the true Vietnamese. We had to hustle. It was really dangerous, because that's where yeah. I shot that man at, remember? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> put your faith in me, the next generation of the true Vietnamese. We had to hustle. 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 Welcome back to Bronx Film Wednesdays. Joining us now is director Adele Free Pham, an activist and filmmaker whose work has appeared in over 50 film festivals on HBO, PBS, and at the Smithsonian. Adele's featured documentary, Nailed It, about the genesis and culture of the Vietnamese nail industry, premiered on PBS in May 2019 and is the highest stream film of the America Reframe series. Welcome, Adele. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. So to start, Adele, even though Vietnamese women, as we learned, are the ones who pioneered the nail industry, uh, the story starts by highlighting men in this industry, like Kelvin. As a viewer, I saw it as Kelvin kind of laying the carpet of flowers for women to tell their story. Can you share your directorial approach with this? Oh, I really like the way you described that. Because in a way, we are bringing them their, their flowers, right? Um, and, and women did start it. And something that is part of the Vietnamese culture is that is what women do. Women are very good at business. And a lot of times, even before they were refugees, women would carry the family um, through their, their business acumen, but it is still a misogynistic culture. So a lot of times women will take the back seat and um, kind of allow the men to drive, I guess, and not contradict that too much. So I think that some of the glory has been taken out of their hands and, and, Something that I find with anything is that the people that um, are the genesis of the movement often don't get the, um, the accolades that they deserve, the praise that they deserve. Um, the reason why it really starts with men is because I don't speak Vietnamese. I think if I was a native Vietnamese speaker, it would have been easier for me to, to access women who primarily speak Vietnamese. But Calvin's kind of a, an interesting Duck. He's a very interesting person, clearly. And he had the idea of making a documentary about the nail salon himself. So it was just kismet when I walked into his salon. It was something that he had already been thinking about for a while, making a documentary. So it just made sense that we paired up. And as a director, um, finding your sources, finding your leads, you need to know when somebody, a character, is a connector to your story. I really appreciated also how the film also opened with people giving different reasons why. Vietnamese people do nails led uh, by the industry, by the history. Can you talk to us about the process of exploring and tracing back the why and the how from Tippy to the refugees? It was all so remarkable. And I just want to hear your, your journey now. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I, people kind of say, well, uh, Tippy doesn't deserve all the credit. You know, uh, how do you know those were the originators? And from all of my research, the women that, uh, you know, came came uh, to, to Camp Hope literally in the months after the end of the Vietnam War were, were the first Vietnamese women to do nails. There's no denying that. And I think it's just something about our cultures it's very chatty and, and these are thousands upon thousands of people that need to figure out how to survive so you have this celebrity in the mix and all these vietnamese people saying hey look at all of these uh upper class vietnamese women here um they hooked up with a hollywood celebrity and now they're they own nail salons so it's almost the mythology of the nail salon was kind of building within that early vietnamese refugee culture you came to the Bronx, Adele. Um, you know, as you know, Pregones, BronxNet, we are located here in the South Bronx, in the Bronx. So I was so happy to see that you came out here to do your nails. Uh, so many nail enthusiasts like Cardi B come from here. We have hundreds of nail salons throughout our communities. I'm curious to know, how did you wind up here and why was it important to highlight the nail culture in the Bronx within your film? Because I was just looking for Vietnamese people in New York City. Uh, <laughs> th this place is a bit weird. That, uh, it's the only place in the country where the Asians that run the nail industry in Manhattan are not Vietnamese or Brooklyn. They're Korean and Chinese. And the Bronx is the only place in New York City where the majority of the nail salons are Vietnamese. And on the same stream, I absolutely love the inclusion of the relationship Vietnamese women and Black women have within nail culture. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the importance of including the influence of Black women within this film. Well, I mean, I really nails may have not popped the way they did without black women. I would say that even more of a definite. So Olivet Robinson is is a, a black woman that I feature in the film who had an early partnership with a Vietnamese refugee woman named Charlie Bo. And their salon was so hot that they were able to open multiple locations in LA in the South Belt Bay of LA within like one year from when they started. So a lot of these man traps that popped up all over the country came from those original man traps in LA. They learned the business there. They saw how popular it was and that they should open these salons in black neighborhoods because they'll be receptive to you. And that's exactly what happened. I wanted to also ask, uh, did creating the film help you get closer to your dad and your Vietnamese side? Definitely helped me get closer to my Vietnamese side. <laughs> I love my dad. Um, definitely. And now, I mean, I, I should have given you guys an updated bio because my next project is called Scent of the Delta. It's a narrative film, not a documentary. And it's about the Vietnamese American experience in New Orleans from a mixed Vietnamese point of view, lead character and her mother's story in 1984. So yeah, I mean, the film opened that door because the, the writer, to win is a good friend of mine, but we became good friends because she saw my film in New Orleans, you know, at, she came to the premiere at the New Orleans Film Festival and we're both nice people and we we're looking for other Vietnamese women in the industry, you know, who are really trying to talk and build with each other. And we just remained friends since then. It's been years and you know, we just hit go for the center of the Delta project and it worked out. You know, so yeah, totally. One door, film should open doors for you. And there's definitely been times where I felt like more doors should have been open, you know, more people should have seen this film, but whatever, I'm on this path, you know, and this next film I'm about to make, like, it's gonna blow everybody's mind. But I'm just so excited to be a part of it because I've also lived in New Orleans and that is a very unique Vietnamese community. Thank you so much for being with us. Before we go, how can we stay in touch with you and see more of your work and find out about that upcoming project? So if you go to Nailed It Doc, that's the handle on Instagram. Also the um, NailedItDoc.com, the, the, the website. But if you want to get in touch with me, just hit me up on Instagram. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us on Bronze Film Wednesdays. And maybe you'll submit the next film to tw the 21 Islands Film Festival. And we'll see you again. I love this 21 islands film festival i definitely want to get on board with that you know and then let's take this film festival across the caribbean i'll be right there <laughs> you're always welcome back thank you so much adele again for your time thank you
that's the end of our show today. I'm your host, Sonji Lopez. Thank you for tuning in and see you next time here at Bronx Film Wednesdays. Thank you.